what I like to call living Tantra. So how do we take, you know, as we might have an idea at this point, Tantra is kind of this deep, rich, profound system, right? It's, um, it's maybe a little more complex than we had originally imagined before signing up for this course. <laughs> and it might feel a little bit daunting, like, oh, I thought it was this thing, and now I'm realizing it's this whole other thing, and like, where do I fit into that? Like, how do I, how do we even do this? <laughs> And many a modern tantrika have had to figure this out, exactly, because not all of us can run away from the world and go do eight hours of sadhana a day, or not all of us are going to meet that teacher or that guru in this lifetime who's going to just tell us where to take the next steps. And not all of us are even interested in sitting and doing elaborate pujas or this or that, right? That's maybe not our path. And yet, Tantra still provides so much for us, you know? And, and so even on a practical level, it's like we might not be practicing classical slash traditional Tantra uh, because of whatever obstacles or a ripening that is yet to happen or who knows. Who knows what the reason is. But it doesn't mean there's nowhere for us to go. And I think one of the best ways that we can start to bring Tantra into our lives, what I like to call living Tantra, is actually via the philosophy and Tantra Yoga. So Tantra Yoga is something that is very accessible to all. Right? It's not necessarily, uh, there's no, there are no <laughs> like quicksand pits to watch out for or volcanoes about to erupt or <laughs> dams about to break or whatever it is in, in the realm of Tantra Yoga, right? There's ways that we can approach that practice with asana, pranayama, mudra, bandha, all of these things. Um, anyone can approach Anybody can approach, adjustments can be made based on physical ability or even, I'm going to say mental ability, I mean that in terms of, as you may have experienced previously, some minds are going to let go easier than others. And so when it comes to the kind of more meditative mental practices, it's like, if that's not for you, there's, there's other options, although we do want to keep working on that area, that ability to be more still, to be more yin. Um, but, but this system is very adjustable, right? We can find a way to, to tailor it to suit us, to fit us, and, and it's, there's no restrictions there with Tantra Yoga. So specifically, Tantra Yoga is where we're working with very specific more, I, w I don't even want to call them physical practices because they go so far beyond the physical, but we're thinking more physical practice. Like, okay, we're in a yoga class, but now with Tantra Yoga, there's going to be a little bit more emphasis on the energetic, on the spiritual. We might have a deeper kind of more meditative practice at the very end, something like this, right? So doors are wide open here. Anyone is welcome in. Whereas classical Tantra doesn't always feel that way. There are things that we just, you know, places that we can't go without certain doors opening for us. We might have our own limitations there. Um, there are more <laughs> uh, minefields in that, in that journey of classical Tantra. Because we're, we're essentially trying to dismantle the self, right? And the self in terms of all of our preferences and dislikes and all these things that kind of keep us bound in duality. Real tantric practice, we're trying to dissolve that. So in that process, there can be some kicking and screaming, to say the least. <laughs> and then there's also the moments of exquisite bliss, right? But it's not, it's not all bliss. That's for damn sure. So I think we get that now. Um, 
But even with the limitations in classical Tantra, I still think there's ways besides just Tantra Yoga that we can incorporate particularly the principles and philosophy of Tantra in our daily lives. Like just like practices aside, just the philosophy is so rich and can give so much context for how we live life, how we show up in relationships, how we walk in balance, right? And we're going to go deeper into, for example, the Yoga Sutras at another point, but if we're on any path of spiritual awakening that involves the body, right? We're not leaving the body behind for some spiritual pursuit. Naturally, there comes a point where we want to walk in greater and greater beauty, right? Tantra is very much a path of beauty. It's a path of getting some of the mess out of the way so that we can embody more and more beauty, right? We all want that, especially those of us with the really feminine essence. It's like we just want beauty everywhere. <laughs> we want beauty inside. We want beauty outside, and that's wonderful, and that is an amazing way to connect in with Tantra. I like to think of it as like the beauty way, right? But it's in every aspect of our lives that we want to bring this in. So what aspects are there? We're actually going to take a moment to go on a little detour to Goddess Lakshmi, <laughs> who is my token goddess for this retreat, which I'm so happy about because her and I have a thing. I mean, I have a thing with several of them, but Lakshmi and me have been like this for a while now. Was someone trying to say something or was that an accident? Okay. Um, so Lakshmi, the reason we're going to go to Lakshmi for a moment is because she helps us balance these four aims of life. And I think these four aims of life can really help us kind of look at these really important pieces in our lives that are of value, you know? And, and our value system is really important when it comes to living Tantra. What is our value system? How do we walk our talk? How do we walk with greater integrity? How do we you know, really do this human thing in a fucking good way, <laughs> right? We're all here because I think we all want that. We want to do this in a good way. And so the four aims that Goddess Lakshmi particularly helps us to balance are dharma. And dharma here is exactly that. It's kind of beauty way. It's right relationship. Oftentimes we think of dharma as like my life purpose, I'm living my dharma, and it can, oftentimes it is connected to dharma, um, sometimes it's not, sometimes we're doing something that's just not that, um, it depends. So what is dharma really? Dharma is, one of the words they use to, to translate the word dharma is righteousness. I don't totally love that because sometimes it has a negative connotation. So I like the, the idea of right relationship better where it's just like we're walking our talk and we're aligned, not just in this plane, but there's a way that we're bringing the spiritual teachings, whatever those are. We're not going to go into like what spiritual teachings or anything, but we're just we're taking spiritual teachings, you know, kindness, <laughs> compassion, um, generosity, whatever that is, and we're actually bringing that here. We're bringing that into this realm. So we might be doing that through our work in the world, right? Oftentimes, especially for those of us who are lucky enough to be self-employed or, or working under an employer that, that has that larger vision that aligns with our own, Oftentimes, our, our line of work will have something to do with making something better in the world, right? That's very much a spiritual thing, part of the beauty way. Let's make this place better than we found it, right? So that's kind of dharma, and it's walking in this way of profound 
spiritual integrity in everything we do. And that comes into our speech, that comes into... Another word for dharma is like right conduct, right? And so we're not doing some like crazy... <laughs> You know, we're not going and robbing banks if we want to be aligned with dharma. We're not, uh, yeah, obviously we know all kinds of examples. So dharma is walking in this really good way. And dharma is very connected to karma because dharma is going to create the good kinds of karma <laughs> that we want <laughs> later on and that are going to help us reach our final goal. So that's dharma. And then we have artha, and artha is our acquirement of wealth. So that gets to be included, yay! We actually get to have things and money and like enjoy life. <laughs> so artha is that because the way we think of it uh, through this lens is not so much, oh, I want to fulfill all my never ending desires because we'll talk about desire with Tantra. De desire is a double-edged sword, my dears. We have infinite desires and we could spend lifetimes after lifetimes chasing them and never get anywhere. So it doesn't mean we can't have desire, but think of that right relationship again. We want to have right relationship with our desires. <laughs> is this one really worth fulfilling, right? My teacher said an amazing thing one time. We were talking about some of the sublime deities. And some of the sublime deities will give you everything you want. But I should phrase that everything you think you want. Because when we do get everything we want, we just kind of learn that we want more. And then we have actually the more attachments we have, the more in bondage we can be. So some of these sublime deities, we might think, oh, I'm all good over here. But they'll enmesh you in a different kind of way. They'll be like, okay, you think you want, okay, I'll keep you, sure, you can have all that. And then you're lost in the illusion of this realm, right? So, as Shamanama likes to say, neti neti, not this, not that. <laughs> there's, always a, there's always a middle path. So, okay, somebody's unmuted and I keep hearing noises. Alice? Can you mute your mic? Thank you. Um, so, where was I? Ardha. So, we do need, you know, here we are in a physical realm. We have needs here. And we have to have those needs provided for. It's really hard to be on a spiritual journey if we are in survival mode. That's just real. You know, we're like root chakra at that point. Root so, swadhisthana, really hard to go beyond that. So it, with artha, it's like, okay, we need to have certain things. So we want to balance like our career. And I, ideally, I think it is really beautiful if we can have dharma and our livelihood intertwined. It's a really beautiful experience. And tantra can help us to start to have more of that kind of experience, right? So artha is the acquirement of wealth, and then we have kama, which is desire, right? So kama is like our enjoyment of life, yeah? So kama very literally translates to desire. Kama is the god. We might, under, we might have heard the word kama from the Kama Sutra, and the Kama Sutra is basically a manual of, of, of love, right? Uh, but kama is not limited just to sex and sexuality and romantic love. Kama is just this, this desire, right? We want this. We want, we want so many things. So we do actually get to enjoy life. We want to enjoy life. We do want love. That is one of our main aims in life is love. So we want to walk in right relationship. We want to have what we need to support our lives, support our families. We want to enjoy our life. We want to enjoy the senses. Like, I don't want to be here in this body just to be, like, trying to get out of this realm or whatever. I want to enjoy this beautiful body that Ma gave me. So that's Kama. And then the last one is Moksha. And Moksha actually is liberation. That's the attainment. That's the, the spiritual end goal. And so a life well and truly lived 
especially those of us in the householder realm, will have a really beautiful balance between these four things, right? We're not getting so lost in kama or in our life love dramas and pleasures and all of this that we forget all about dharma and right relationship or that we forget about moksha, right? We don't want to go on our pursuit of wealth to the expense at the expense of our relationships, right? And so through tantric philosophy, we can kind of look at this and be like, okay, these are all things that I value. And how can I really be with these different aspects of life in a way that's, you know, that's, that's deeply fulfilling, right? We all want to live like deeply fulfilling lives. <laughs> and Tantra is going to give us a map and a way to do that. So, when it comes to living Tantra, some very practical ways we can go about that are simply in, I like to think of it as a path of tending, right? And I think this goes along also if we talk about working as priestesses or embodying the priestess or something like this. What does a priestess do? She tends. So we're tending to our bodies, right? We're tending to our space. So this could be our home. This can give us a little bit more inspiration to do our household chores and to keep our space nice. Um, we want to tend our relationships, right? Especially those that are really of, of value to us. We want to tend our careers, right? We want to tend our communities. We want to tend the earth. Right? At some point, this just keeps going. It's like, how can I be in a deep stewardship of myself and my surroundings in a way that is going to uplift and create more and more beauty? So this is a way that we can bring the principles of Tantra into our daily life. Where are the, you know, which of those four areas is a little deficient? Maybe I can put more energy there. Which one is a little excessive? Maybe I need to pull back a little bit there. How do I keep all these things in balance? How do I walk my talk? How do I walk in greater and greater care? Right? And again, what we want to think is any time we're being led to an extreme, it's, it's not... I'm thinking of this in terms of Neo-Tantra, which, by the way, we're going to be talking about shortly. So in Neo-Tantra, one of the pitfalls, I would say, is that we're led to a some, some teachers, I won't say this of every, but some of the teachers of Neo-Tantra will really lead you into this extreme of Kama, right? It's Kama out of balance. And this can be really... You can lose your center more than you find it. So a good sign that you're on a spiritual path or on a path that is really good for you is that you're able to more and more keep your center, not losing it into different places. One of the things that will happen as we go deeper and deeper into practice and as practitioners is that we start to generate more and more shakti, more and more power. And we'll start to become acutely aware of the ways that we lose that power. Certain people that pull on it, certain situations that pull on it, even just speaking too much, right? If you go and you're like super social and you're like blah, 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 you'll notice that you lost some energy from talking so much. Um, we start to become very aware of the transaction of our energy, if that makes sense. So when it comes to Neo-Tantra, where there's a lot of encouragement to just give so much of your energy in a very particular way, especially when it's high-octane sexual energy, we want to be uh, mindful of how we are giving that, how we are containing it, and, and who we're interacting with, how we're interacting with them, that kind of thing. So... Boundaries are a really good thing, 
but we don't want them to be rigid, right? And as we practice, we'll start to learn how to have what I like to call osmotic boundaries. Boundaries are really moment to moment related. Usually if we have those kind of like BAM boundaries, it's because some piece of trauma was hit. And similarly, if we tend to have like no boundaries, it's also usually a trauma thing. It's usually something from childhood that has us do that. Whereas healthy boundaries are actually able to be like, you're listening, just like the practice we just did. Where's the edge here? Where am I still in stewardship, in authority of my own energy? Yeah? So we don't want to go to extremes. Extremes are always going to be depleting. That's, that's one thing we can look at in tantric philosophy is that anytime we're on an extreme, you can guarantee that it's going to be depleting, whether it's too much or too little. This actually shows up in one of the texts of the goddess called um, the Durga Saptashati. This is a tale of Durga's battle with several different demons, but two of those demons are Shumba and Nishumba, and their names mean too much and too little. So we have a tendency, this is the all or nothing I was talking about earlier, I've definitely been, I still work with this one, but we tend towards too much or too little, and we tend to oscillate. It's very exhausting. Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand if you find that exhausting. Too much, too little, too much, too little. I'm too much, I'm not enough. No, 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 it can be our inner voices, whatever. And that our practices, our practice of Tantra is really going to help us locate that place that is not too much, it's not too little, right? We're going to slay those demons. Shakti is going to help us slay those demons so that we can find that middle path that is in right relationship, right? Where we are in deep and profound stewardship and tending of our energy. And from there, we're going to have the crystalline clarity and ability in the mind and the heart, right? All the centers are going to be in a line to move with deep grace, with deep understanding, with deep care, and we're going to be able to respond to life rather than react to life, right? What's a reaction? Reaction is something, it's, it's a pattern, <laughs> right? So oftentimes we're facing life from, from kind of our conditioned ways, right? Something happens and we have this automatic reaction. There's nothing conscious about our reactions, right? And that is a, an obstruction, that is a bondage. That is a place we're not free. Wherever we react is a place we're not free. And that's okay. We all have plenty of those places, right? But what we want is we want to be able to start responding to life, right? A situation arises and I don't just go automatically into this reaction. I can be curious. I can listen. I can lean in or lean back or whatever needs to happen in that moment. And that's where you know, the practice really starts to come to life. That's freedom. Freedom is our, our ability to choose in each moment. Yeah? So, that's kind of my idea of living Tantra. And I want to go a little bit into Tantra for the modern world and talk about the left hand of Tantra and the right hand of Tantra. Some confusions that there are and then some clarifications of, of things. So it is true. I want to go into a little bit about classical Tantra versus Neo-Tantra. Neo-Tantra meaning uh, sacred sexuality teachings, uh, intimacy work, polarity work, right? So one of the biggest things we want to keep in mind is that this is a non-dual system masquerading as a dual system right? Duality is the training wheels, and eventually we want to get rid of those training wheels, okay? So we don't want to become fixated on polarity because that will eventually become a crutch that gets in the way of us getting to the next level, 
right? Like a video game or something. There are levels. If we're obsessed with duality, there's a point where this is important. I think when we're healing, because we do have to go through a purification first. And oftentimes, how much of our healing has to do with the masculine or the feminine, right? We have to heal our wounds with the masculine. We have to heal our wounds with the feminine. And it can be really helpful to compartmentalize things while we're in the purification process. So I think polarity work has a really great place here where we are really dissecting like masculine and feminine and this and that. And there's a lot of fun that can happen in there. Like polarity is real and it's, it can be pleasurable. It can also be agonizing. <laughs> it can be all of the things, right? We've all been in relationships before. They can be all the things. But we don't want to fixate there. And we don't want to fixate there because, like I said, at some point, that over-identification with things in labels is not actually going to be helpful for us, right? It's just going to be another bondage <laughs> for us to be stuck in the binary reality of, of duality. So... We want to use it as a tool and re realize it's not the final destination. One of the ways I like to talk about Neo-Tantra, having come from that background, and I still even also teach um, some Neo-Tantric practice, but that's based in the philosophy of traditional Tantra, is that it's kind of like... So classical Tantra, traditional Tantra, does include sexuality and it does include sexual practice. But we're going to dissect that more in a moment. What often happens with, with the kind of neo-Tantra thing is it's like we go to this extraordinary temple, right? Or just fixating on the sexual piece, I should say. It's like we go to this extraordinary, miraculous, mystical temple and the architecture is so just incredible, right? And I'm thinking of the temples in India, and it's like these temples are so beautiful. And you have to go in to the temple, and at some point there's an inner sanctum, and that's where the deity is, right? That's where the murti is, that's where the shakti is, the energy. And you go there, and you make your offerings, and you receive the blessings, and it's like, boom, that's where you get what's called the darshan. Darshan is this energetic um, exchange with the deity, could also be with a guru, a high-level master. Um, so, unfortunately, when we think that Tantra is only about sex, it's like we've gone to this incredible temple, and inside is this sh shakti, this power, this energy, but we don't even go in because we're so enamored with the gateway. We're just like, wow, I've arrived. And we miss out on the entire, like the juice, right? So the juice is in the inner sanctum. And so we want to, first of all, just be really clear that Tantra is not sacred sexuality. It's not. That's not what it is. Now, at some point, and I think, um, <clears throat> well, I won't go into it, but at some point it became kind of translated into the West like that. And we have a tendency as Westerners to grab, we're very into the material in the West, right? We're a little bit of a spiritually deficient culture over here, especially in the U.S. It's fine. That's not a bad thing, but it's part of the reason we tend to go looking elsewhere because our own culture doesn't provide a lot for us, unfortunately, in this realm. So... But we tend to have a much deeper fixation on the material. So when we go to Eastern traditions, we have a bad habit of grabbing the most physical aspect of a practice and thinking it's the thing. So, for instance, there are eight limbs of yoga. We grabbed asana, brought it over here, and have turned it into a whole other thing which is still beneficial. So I don't want to, to get into the uh, side of things that is shamey or blamey because I think that this has actually been a very positive thing because regardless, yoga helps people. It helps calm the mind. It helps ease anxieties. Whether or not you've got that connection to the rest of the limbs. But we want to understand 
it's not the whole system and there's a lot missing when that happens. So that also happened with Tantra when it comes to the, the sexual piece, right? We kind of got excited about that. We're like so used to the kind of um, old Christian or Catholic teachings that that's sin and that this and that or whatever. I don't even know exactly how it all happened, but we got really excited about a spiritual path that doesn't say we can't be sexual beings because for fuck's sake, we all are, right? We all got here that way. It's some of the most powerful energy in the universe and we are pulled by that energy through our entire lives, right? It's so important and it's one of the core places that we have a lot of work to do to walk in right relationship, to be in dharma with our sexuality, right? So I think this is another one of those places where while I have my own thoughts about how we kind of grabbed that, ran with it, improvised a lot of what Neo-Tantra is today, I don't necessarily also think it's a bad thing. I think it's actually very helpful because we all have so much work to do around healing sex and sexuality. And if we don't heal that, we simply cannot become whole. It absolutely, we are at a point in humanity where we cannot go further spiritually until we've integrated our sexuality in a healthy way. But we have to be clear what healthy looks like when it relates to sex and sexuality because it gets really sticky when we go into these realms. So, so Neo-Tantra, I think what I really want to clarify here is that a lot of what is now called Neo-Tantra that's being uh, taught does not have much connection to traditional Tantra. It just doesn't. Some of it does. Some of it completely does not. So this is a place to have discernment and to just know the teachings are great, but this might be like sacred sexuality might be more accurate for certain things than calling them Tantra. And I think it's important that we do specify because the, it's, it's Tantra is just being used now for that, but that we specify it's Neo-Tantra, right? And that's, I think, a really important thing we need to do to honor the tradition, because the thing about lineage is it dies if we confuse it. It dies if we don't continue it, if we don't protect it, if we don't say, my God, this is so fucking precious, I'm not just going to flush it down the toilet or adulterate it or this kind of thing. It's really important that we have both those who are preserving lineage so it doesn't die. Because remember, these are people who were able to see what we have a hard time seeing now in the Kali Yuga. It's really important this doesn't get mixed and matched and turned into something it's not. Okay? And we also, we do live in different times. We do need ingenuity. We do need, you know, like tradition can be binding also, right? And so, but the, it's if very, I think what I want to say here is it's just a very fine line between tradition and ingenuity and how to walk between the two with the utmost grace. And I think especially with Tantra, this has kind of become my passion is just to be really clear what's what because there has become so much confusion in the West. So traditionally, there are two streams of Tantra. I mean, there's so many, but, but technically the streams fall within either left hand or right hand. So in India, we all have two hands, most of us, hopefully, two hands. And in India, you eat with your right hand only and you eat with your hands. Not, not so much anymore, but if you're in the village or something, you go to dinner, you're going to be eating with your hand. Right hand, because we do something else with our left hand. Can anyone guess what we do with our left hand in India? We wipe our bottoms. Yeah. We wipe our bottoms with our left hand. So, <laughs> 
in India, this is also changing. I'm kind of sad about it. I actually enjoy both of those things. When I first started going to India, it was still mostly only water. And you just, you pour water from a pitcher and you just clean yourself. And you use the left hand and you wash afterwards. And it's actually great. I love it. Someone once said, if you got shit on your face, would you wash it off? Or would you just take a piece of paper and wipe it off? I was like, that's a really good point. <laughs> so they wash it <laughs> with water and their left hand. They eat with the right. So this is kind of where the whole left hand, right hand came from. So the right hand is like the very clean tantric path, which means that it is more aesthetic. It's more, you know, a lot of times there's celibacy involved. You're not eating meat. You're not consuming alcohol. Um... You're not oftentimes married, like this is less often a householder path. Although the Tantra that I am practicing now is more right hand path Tantra. And um, so you, you can be a householder and do it. I'm not celibate, I do eat meat, I do drink alcohol, but I'm still doing more of this uh, right handed path regardless. So on the left hand, so on the right hand, we have more of those internal practices, right? So we're working a lot internally. Um, there can still be external rituals. They would, they look different than on the left hand. So let's go to the left hand. I think we've talked a lot already about the right hand because I have most of my orientation in that side nowadays. And the left hand is rather uh, extreme. So most of us wouldn't actually be that interested in the left-hand path of Tantra as it relates to traditional Tantra. So let's talk about the left-hand and traditional Tantra. So the left-hand path, the furthest extreme of the left-hand path in Tantra would be the Agoris. The Agoris, has anybody heard of the Agori, Sadhus, Babas? Raise your hand if you have. There's a great documentary about them. I'll try to scrounge it up. So these are these like sadhus who wear only black or they're naked sometimes. They literally hang out in cremation grounds like where they burn the bodies. They smear the ash from the cremation ground on their bodies. And they will find a human skull cup and that's their begging bowl. They only eat what they get from existence and they eat it out of their skull cup which is to remind them every time they eat that they're gonna die. There are some who are so extreme that they eat nothing except the flesh of bodies who have human bodies that have washed up on the banks of the Ganga or wherever they are. Yep, that's how extreme. They meditate, they'll actually meditate on dead bodies in the cremation ground. They'll sit on top of them to do their sadhanas or practices. Um, so this is like the most extreme, right? This is, but that's how deep it goes on the left-hand path, right? And the idea with it is, okay, so I just said the whole thing about avoiding extremes. The idea with that is that if you go so extreme at some point, it's like the mind has such a hard time even wrapping around everything I just said and that people would want to do this, that you are... You just, at some point, you just, like, pop out of duality because you're so far into, like, the gnarliest part of it, right? So, that's the Agoris. But, okay, we're going to back up quite a bit now. So, we don't have to be Agoris to be on the left-hand path. The other left-hand path involves sexual rituals, involves animal sacrifice, Still to this day, uh, some left-handed temples practice animal sacrifice. It involves drinking alcohol during pujas, <laughs> which is really hilarious. I sat at a puja once at Kamakya Temple in Assam, which is one of the places where the goddesses Yoni fell to earth. It's a really important tantric temple. And I was in a puja there with these two priests. And they had a bottle, I kid you not, like one of the grande, like whiskey, I think it was whiskey, I don't know, it might have been rum. Anyway, it was something, I think it was whiskey. And by the, through the puja, we weren't drinking, we were participating in the puja, but only the priest drank. They drank the entire bottle between the two of them 
throughout this, you know, hour, two hour long puja. And they do that regularly. I was like, and then they go and drive home. <laughs> I was like, hopefully it all got, tra the idea is that it gets transmuted. It's actually consumed by the deity through them. And they were surprisingly, I don't know if it was just that they had such a tolerance built up or, you know, I believe in this stuff. They might have just really, that's what happened. And they were mostly fine afterwards. It was really wild. So they use what are called the, the five panchamakarams. We're not going to go, you don't need to write this down. We don't really need to focus so much on that. We're not going to be wor working with these here in this training. But those, those are all these things that are kind of taboo in more traditional, like Hinduism or this kind of thing. So the five offerings normally in the right hand path would be uh, sandalwood paste for the earth element or some kind of scented oil, flowers for the ether element, incense for the earth element, um, food or sweets for definitely not meat, like like sattvic food, like really pure vegetarian food for the water element. And did I miss an element? A flame or a ghee lamp for the fire element. So on the left side, the five offerings are, let me see if I can remember what they correspond to. I believe it's mudra or grain, which I never fully understood why grain, uh, for the earth element. Fish, like actual fish, for the water element. Meat for the fire element, so actual meat, which again, these are all, I'm not sure again why the grain, but everything else is very obviously counter to traditional Hindu culture. Um, what did I do? Grain. Alcohol for the... What is alcohol? Is that air element? Alcohol might be air element. Or is it ether? I'm going to get air and ether, so don't quote me on this. And then my tuna, I think would be the ether element, but it could be air also. I'll look that up. I'm going to clarify that. But my tuna is sexual union, right? Or even sometimes they would use sexual fluids. So these are the five offerings on the left-hand path, right? And... So I want to clarify what uh, what would a sexual practice or offering look like in the left-handed tantric side of things. So they do do things uh, called, so we heard about pujas. So one of the hallmarks of tantra that I think is really beautiful and um, the Guruji of the Sri Vidya lineage that I studied with him, he was actually, he was like left and right hand path, right? He didn't so much do the other panchamakaras besides the sexual pieces, but I did receive some um, experiences within the left side of things. So something that's really beautiful is that in Tantra we realize that we are the deities. They're not something separate from us. And so in some rituals or practices, you'll actually be the Morti. You are the deity and other people, Pujaris, Pujarinis, this is what the ritual practitioners are called, they'll actually do the Puja to you as the goddess. So one of the Pujas that they do, or two, three of them, are Yoni Pujas, where they'll actually stimulate the woman's vagina, or Yoni, to get the sexual fluids flowing. And to move that energy up to start to embody the, the goddess. And they'll make all the offerings to the yoni. And they touch different parts of the body. They implant mantras. It's very ritualistic, right? Extremely ritualistic. So it's not necessarily such a sexy thing when you're in the experience. Because what happens with the mantras and the very specific ritual that's I don't know how old these rituals are even, but what happens with the specific rituals, it actually gets the sexual energy to move past Manipura or the solar plexus and into the higher chakras. What happens when the energy actually moves past Svadhisthana is you stop having sensory pleasure altogether. I'm saying this from experience. It becomes divine. 
something else happens. I don't really know how to describe it with words because I've never had this experience in this way again, but it becomes transcendental, right? And uh, so at some point it's not that sexy anymore, <laughs> let me just say. It's something else. It's profound, but it's, it's of a whole other um, spectrum and quality. So they also have lingam pujas that are done in the same fashion, and there's maituna pujas. Maituna puja is where a couple would come together in sexual union, and there would be pujaris around, and they'd be doing the offerings and do that same whole puja, but this couple is now representing Shiva and Shakti. So the reason that they do all of the whole ritual, there's a whole preparation to get you out of being halo. I'm no longer halo. I am now goddess Tripur, Lalita Tripura Sundari. And it actually happens. The puja, the rest can't happen until that actually happens. It's like a replacement of consciousness. Think of yourself as the small container. And now you're this way bigger, larger container, right? So for it to happen even, like the Maituna Puja, the woman and the man have to be brought into those higher levels of consciousness and then it comes together. So it's a whole thing that a lot of Westerners probably wouldn't have the patience for, to be honest. <laughs> but it's so beautiful and so powerful and so rich and profound. Now aside from that, there is another thing called consort practice. And consort practice is where two practitioners will come together and they will use sexual practices to kind of catapult their own uh, progress, their own spiritual progress. So how that looks in the traditional tantric system, right now we're just kind of understanding where Neo-Tantra kind of came from, where the ideas came from. So in, in consort practice, this was reserved for very high level practitioners only. You would not receive these teachings unless you were at a level of spiritual maturity because spiritual maturity is very necessary to start to work with sexual energy because it has such a powerful pull and such a deep karmic influence connected to it, right? So you have to be able to kind of counteract those effects and you have to be very strong in your energy body and in your consciousness to be able to do that without uh, any energetic entanglements, this kind of thing. So oftentimes the consort couldn't be a, a partner, right? So it would have to be another practitioner and one that you're not intimately involved with. And again, it would be something, I mean, it would be more like doing your yoga practice with another person where you're both deep in the practice and the focus is not the pleasure. The focus is, yes, activating the sexual energy, the ojas, the fluids, but then sublimating it, right? So we're using that as this kind of like rocket fuel because it's a very strong energy to catapult some spiritual progress. Now, with my old Guruji, he would, and with someone you're not attracted to, very likely, yeah, I'm not sure about that, but I would imagine, yeah, it would be, you're, you don't want entanglements as a practitioner. So imagine, these are already very high-level practitioners. They're not going to want to, like, hook up with somebody and then not be able to stop thinking about them afterwards and blah, blah, blah. Like, they're coming in, they're like, we're going to do a thing. And literally, there's one goal here. You're Shiva, I'm Shakti, we're freaking doing, yeah, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> it's a whole thing. I haven't even received those teachings, right? But my Guruji... Uh, from from the Sri Vijaya lineage, he was very into giving this to householders, but even he, who was a very liberal-minded Indian and who uh, was very a controversial figure as far as modern India is concerned, he would only give sexual teachings to married couples because, you again, there has to have been a, a kind of karmic agreement beforehand 
before going into these practices, whereas a married couple in these systems, they're kind of seen as one body to some degree because they're so intertwined, right? So even he wouldn't give those teachings unless they were married couples to some degree. Um, there were some practitioners he would tr uh, impart the teachings to who are then able to hold the pujas and who can do some of that consort practice stuff, but as far as just practitioners who weren't moving past a certain level, you had to be married to receive those teachings. So what we can do, this is another place where it's like, okay, that doesn't mean that we can't go there, because I know we're all curious about it, and that's probably why a lot of us are here. There's like a curiosity here. And we can use, again, the principles and philosophies of Tantra in these realms, in the realms of dealing with sex and sexuality and intimacy and polarity and all of this, and that's kind of what Neo-Tantra has done. But we want to be clear that those practices aren't Tantra, as in the mother meaning of the word, the mother tradition, where it came from, what it actually is, right? It's different. It's now Neo-Tantra. And it borrows on those principles. And so a lot of the stuff that we find in Neo-Tantra, including some of the stuff I teach, has been created, right, by the teachers, by the facilitators over time. Some things are getting passed around here and there. There are some trickles in from those left-hand practices in actual classical Tantra, but it's more rare to find that. Um, yeah, so there's ways. It's like we can take the idea of the Yoni Puja or the Lingam Puja and do the offerings and make our own sacred ritual with that. There's nothing wrong with doing that, right? These are beautiful ideas or coming together with that idea. We call it transfiguration. I was trained in... Um, Neo Tantra at a school in Thailand that had a really strong traditional basis in Kashmir Shaivism. And what they did was they kind of took those teachings and applied them to sex and sexuality to make it sacred, to make it a part of our spiritual path to have this. And we would have these beautiful rituals called transfigurations where we would have all the women in the center in a circle facing outward and then all the men, or, no, it was the men in the center, the women would be on the outer place, so it was like the yoni and the lingam. We'll go more into that in another point. So the yoni is the female genitalia, lingam is the male, and there's a symbol, a very famous tantric symbol, still all over India to this day, even though they deny it, it, it is what it is, but <laughs> it's basically a a uh, lingam penetrating a yoni, but it represents something much larger than that. It's, it's the, the, the penetration of consciousness within form is what that means. But the symbol is very literal, if that makes sense. It's like, yeah, very literal. So, so we would kind of d create this, like we had the pillar, the Shiva pillar in the center, right? It's like static, it's the lingam, and then we would have the women around representing the yoni surrounding the lingam. And then the women would rotate, the men would stay in the center, and we would do eye gazing and transfiguration and do the five elemental offerings going around the circle. And it was really beautiful because you were never just with one partner. So you'd have to like practice seeing Shiva in all these different masculine faces or, or seeing Shakti in all these different feminine faces. And it was really profound and there was a result from that practice. So it's not to say you can't go into Neo Tantra and receive something really deep and profound and healing because there is so much there. And it's not to say that we can't learn more about Tantra and then take those principles and apply them in all of these areas of our life, Tantra is very, I think, available for us to do that, to bring it into our lives without having to become intensive sadhikas or practitioners of traditional Tantra. But we owe it to the system that we're borrowing from. And nowadays there's so much talk about cultural appropriation and you know, honoring colonized peoples, which India was colonized by the British for, my God, like 300 years or something like that. 
So we do have to be very respectful as Westerners stepping into a tradition that's not our home tradition. And one of the ways we can do that is by getting to know the actual tradition, and especially as com coming out as teachers, to be able to delineate and share what is what to your students. So even if we're going into neo-tantric practices, we're very clear about, okay, this is what we're doing now. This is what this is, right? And this is what this is. I think it's a really, it doesn't mean we can't do anything, but that we're really clear and we're walking in a dharmic way with that about what is what and where, where is our territory and where is not, right? And um, this is definitely something. I, I, from this point, 15 years later, I teach from a place of having messed this up several times <laughs> and, uh, and learned a lot in the process. You know, when I first came into these paths, I was very naive and I was throwing mantras around <laughs> that I shouldn't have and doing a lot of things. So there's room for error. You're allowed to mess up and we do our best not to and we do our best to really approach these teachings with respect because they will give us so much and they will give us so much more if we do approach them with that that orientation and that care and that just like wow like thank you ma for opening this up to me right i also believe that we've all had so many lifetimes yeah and some of us have probably had lifetimes in india and probably had lifetimes with these teachings and these paths i'm certain that i have i've had so many remembrances along the way and aha moments and so for me, it's been a return, you know, it's like this returning to something that my soul knows, like a through line that I forgot about for the first part of this lifetime and then picked back up. But still, now it's like, okay, I have to kind of relearn some things and figure some things out and, and we live in a different time. So the Neo-Tantra teachings, practices, etc. are very important for our time because... One of the biggest places we need healing is around sex and sexuality. But we want to be mindful about how we approach those teachings because sexual energy is very alluring. It's very karmic. It's very... It can pull us out of our center. So one of my favorite teachings, one of the areas I, I do still very much focus on sex and sexual energy is I actually teach what I call the Taoist feminine arts, which are the practices, sexual energy cultivation practices for women from the Taoist system. And I like these because these are actually the practices that the Taoists were doing and there's not been any kind of improvisation with them. And, um, and I've taken some liberties and brought those in, brought some of the tantric philosophies in to working with those practices, which have made them even more rich. So where was the tangent I was going with that? Um, so one of the teachings that I've, I've taught my students when it comes to working with sexual energy and finding that greater discernment, right? Because... What I see in a lot of Neo-Tantra is there's a lot of encouragement, especially for women, to have less boundaries and to be more available to kind of male consumption, for lack of better terms. And I think it can be really damaging for some women who get caught up if they don't have a, an already strong enough system of holding their energy, right? And I know that... Um, even working in these realms, there's a way that we can give the energy that we can offer the fullness of the feminine without losing energy or having it being kind of sucked, so to speak. Okay, we can do that. Let me kind of close this thread up, though, because I did open the can of worms. I'll close it up quickly. Um, so the point I'm getting at is there is... Speaking of the chakras being working cohesively, I like to think of three of the main centers that we work through with our intelligence, with our wisdom, with that embodiment, is the womb, the heart, 
and the, the third eye, the mind's eye. So one of the best ways to know when we're working in the realms of the sexual or how to, how to use discernment and how to kind of seal our energy up or know when to not seal it up, when to open and flow and surrender, is to check in with these three centers. I call it the trinity of consent. So sometimes our loins will be like, yes, 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 and something in our mind is like, oh, I shouldn't, this isn't going to be good, da, 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 da. So we want to listen. We can't be open channels if one of these centers is closed, if one of these centers is a no. So we want to have the heart on board, especially as women. It's really important for us to not have residue after a sexual encounter for our hearts to be open. Otherwise, the energy will get stuck. Same with the mind on a level. We can't have that hesitation. We can't be holding back. Some of the greatest advice I was ever given was actually by a Vedic astrologer who looked at my chart and he was like, you need to have tantric sex. I was like, okay. <laughs> this was Amachi's astrologer, by the way, if you know the, the, the um, saint Amma, the hugging saint. I was very surprised because her ashram in India is very like, not left-hand path at all, so to have one of the astrologers tell me that, I was like, wow, okay, that must really be in my chart, for reals, makes sense, but he told me that I should never have sex unless I'm 100% total in the experience, and at first I was like, what? well, duh, you know, but when I really thought about it, I started thinking of those little parts of me that would go into an encounter like this, and I would do it anyway. And those were always the encounters that left a bad taste in my mouth or had some funky karma or I couldn't get the, the person out of my head or whatever it was. Who knows what I'm talking about? Give me the hands up if you know what I'm talking about right now. So I developed through self-observation and being in these realms this idea of the trinity of consent, where it's like we actually check in. Okay, is my womb good with this? Are my loins? Like, because we need that. You gotta have, you know, because other times it's like our heart and our head are like, this is a great guy, but nothing's happening. Or woman, I shouldn't, I don't want to be binary there. But if we can check in, like, okay, is, do I feel good here with this? Do I feel good here with this? Is my mind like, yes, this is, this is, a good thing, right? So this is how we can start to bring that dharma, that greater awareness, also into our sex and sexuality, and that's going to help be a meter for how to navigate that energy in our lives, because it's a strong force, it's with us, it's amazing, and we want to have the best experiences with it we possibly can have, right? And so we just learn how to, how to be with it in a way that's really conscious and really total.